are again. Good morning, everybody. And you're welcome. Those who are looking in on the broadcast on this video, thank you for doing so. We are in the book of John. We're going through the uh, gospel. We're going through chronologically. And we got, uh, we've been in John chapter 14 for some time now. Um, what we have found is that there's a tremendous, tremendous amount of um, information and teachings that the Lord Jesus was presenting to the disciples in that upper room at that last supper we call it. So we're going to um, <clears throat> just have a, a, a look at this again and continue on. We're in John chapter 14. And we ended at verse 27 last time, so we're starting on 28, but we'll back up a little bit on 27. Let's have a word of prayer, first of all. For Father, we, we thank you in Jesus Christ's name and ask, the Lord, that you'd help us to understand these things and make applications to our own hearts. Thank you for the Bible, the Word of God. And uh, Lord, just help us now. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, last week we talked about, uh, what we notice in the verse 27, the second time he says, let not your heart be troubled. It's up to each one of us to protect our own hearts. What is it about the heart? The heart's the center of your being, isn't it? A lot of things proceed from your heart. You know, even our words, you know, come out. That's where it all comes from. Very important things. So he says, don't let it be troubled. He says, don't let it be afraid. And that word afraid there is the same word that's used over in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. God has not given us the spirit of fear of power and of love and of a sound mind. So he doesn't want that to, uh, uh, for us. But we can see from that that there are some uh, things that God has said that uh, are given to, uh, to us that we have to tend to ourselves. Okay, when you uh, go down to sit down at the table to eat your, your lunch or your dinner and you don't pray and ask the Lord to feed you, he says, no, I've given you arms and hands and fingers and stuff. And there's a fork and a spoon and a knife. Away you go. We can do some things he's expected, some of the things to do for ourselves. Um, one of the things here, he says, don't you let your heart be troubled. Don't let it be afraid. It's something to think about. You take that, that we, could, we could and probably should spend the whole message on that, but you take that thing and you think on that and you study that and you go over that, uh, what he said about our, our hearts. Don't let your heart be afraid. Um, we often let our hearts be afraid because of uh, things that take place, things we don't understand. Um, uh, why the heart? Just it's the heart is the seat of emotions, the seat of understanding. It's the core of our whole being. Okay. It's the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. The Bible tells us that. There's something to think about. Just think on that. And that's the second time he says it. If God says something one time, it's pretty important, eh? He says this twice in, in this chapter. <clears throat> twice, okay? So something to think about. If you can't get if you can't remember anything else today, remember that. Take that and you think on that. And you think about your heart and the importance of it and the importance of keeping it free from fears and such. What does he tell us in Philippians chapter four? I think it's verse three and four. He says be careful for nothing. The word careful means anxious. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything with thanksgiving and supplication let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. Okay? Uh, we all have uh, things that, we, that, that uh, we're afraid of and come upon us. He says, look, you don't have to do that. You don't have to carry it. Uh, I was reading... Uh, uh, in Acts and my devotions and saw uh, a verse that really jumped out at me. I like it when the Lord does that. It talked about and after uh, some got saved and they walked in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. We have the Spirit of God within us to comfort us in those times. And when we let our hearts be afraid or whatever else, we're not letting Him do His job. We're taking it upon ourselves. Then, no, I'll handle that. No, I don't want to handle it. I can't handle it. Lord, would you do this? Would you handle this? Would you handle me? Something to think about. This is what he says. So, and we have here in this uh, um, 
where we're looking at here from verse 28 down to verse 31 is a continuation, of course, of the previous verses and such, but one of the uh, topics that the Lord's introducing uh, started at verse 16, and it's about the Comforter. How he's going to go away, and then he says, I'm going to come back unto you, and then you're going to have the Comforter, and the Comforter will come and be inside you and give you that first thing, comfort. And we should do a whole uh, a session sometime on the Holy Spirit and what he does and so on and so forth. But he's called the Comforter. It's one that comes alongside and helps those who can't help themselves. Okay, That's the Holy Spirit right there. Let's carry on to verse 28 now. You have heard how I said unto you. Now that immediately made reminded me of, we were talking about, I think last week, Matthew chapter 5 uh, to chapter 7. The Sermon on the Mount, uh, serious, serious stuff that the Lord Jesus had sent, uh, given for the uh, disciples. He says in there, I forget, that, was it 12 or 14 times, a number of times, he says, you have heard it said to them of old time, actually our Bible says by them, but the word actually means to them, from God to them. He's, You've heard it said to them of old time, such and such and such, but I say unto you, okay, now here he is again. You have heard that I said unto you. This is serious stuff. Imagine if God was standing in here or in here in this room right now, and we're listening to him, and he says, But I say unto you, I'm telling you this. This is so important, I want you to grasp it and take hold of it. This is what he's telling me. He says, I'm going away. But the comforter is going to come. Okay? And let's carry on. But ye have heard how I said unto you, uh, I go away and come again unto you. Now, I believe he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Some might say he's when he, from the resurrection. But in this, the context of our passage is the Holy Spirit. When's he going to come? That's Pentecost. Okay, I believe, I believe that's what he's talking about. That may not be correct, but if you take the, uh, the, uh, um, the context of the thing, you're going to find that that's what he's talking about. And we talked about last week about these three are one and so on and so forth. And we read in uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 9, that if any have not the Spirit of Christ, there are none of his. It's the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of the Father, the Holy Spirit. There he is within the believer. You've heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. Um, but look what he says. He says, I'm going away, and do you suppose their faces were sad or something? Maybe they had, like, their countenance was changed a bit. Um, these are uh, individuals who walked with the Lord, saw Him, they ate with Him, they spent all their time with Him. He says, I'm going away. They'd be a little sad, right? They'd be a little sad. But look at what he says. Um, where are we, 28? If ye loved me, ye would rejoice, because I said I'd go unto the Father. Now, just stop for a minute and think about that. He says, I'm going unto the Father. I'm going to send the, the Comforter. Um, we have uh, something here for us to consider, to think about. Um, when a Christian passes on, when a Christian dies, yes, we uh, mourn as those, uh, not as those that have no hope. Because people that don't have any hope, the unsaved, they just don't know. It's a lot of fear. They don't know what's happening. And it's just a sad, I remember... Um, some of the funerals that I've done, sometimes people are just wailing. It's just, break your heart. And they don't know the Lord. It's terrible. He says, but if you loved me, you would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father. Yes, we will miss somebody, but just think about where they're going. You know, uh, we're all going to buy it sometime. We're all going to be gone sometime. Uh, not to be negative. This isn't negative. This is positive. He's bringing this as a positive thing. He says to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. When we leave here, the Christian leaves here into the presence of God Almighty, in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. We should be jumping up and down shouting, hallelujah. Okay? Somebody mentioned it to me one time. It's kind of like with some, it's not really like it, but my brain's pretty small. I like little simple things to, uh, to help me understand things. Um, it's like if you were to go... Uh, one of your uh, family members or something, they're going to, say they're going to go over to England, they're going to jump on a ship uh, or a plane, whatever, and they're going to go to England, OK? 
Okay? And they're gone from you. And then they're going to be there in a long time. But you know where they are. You know they're all right. They're just over there. They're just up there with him. What a thing. What a thing for the Christian. He says, if you love me, you would rejoice. I'm going to the Father. Let us rejoice. And there is rejoicing. Yeah, there's sadness. And there's and all those things will be present too. But underlying, or maybe we should say over and above it all, should be rejoicing. Um, I, I, I remember, I mentioned this a while ago to somebody. Um, I got a call from a Bible school one day and one of my favorite teachers had just died. He had just, he was only about 65 or so, he just dropped dead, just at that point, gone. He was in good health, ran every day, all that stuff. In fact, he died on out his run. And, uh, and I thanked him for calling and letting me know. And then it just, just swept over me. It wasn't sadness. It was just such a joy that he was in the presence of the Lord. His Lord was there with Jesus. It was amazing. That was the Holy Spirit. That was amazing. This is what Jesus is talking about here. Um, if ye love me. Now these are applications. The interpretation is he's talking about himself going away and trying to help them understand. Don't be sad. Don't be sad about this. I'm going to the Father. He says, for my Father is greater than I. Now we have a thing here where sometimes you argue with people and they say, well, oh, Jesus never said he was God. Yeah, well, you're not reading the Bible right. Maybe you don't understand it because you're not saved. You've got to trust in Jesus Christ to understand the Bible. The Spirit of God will help you understand these things, okay? And if people say, he isn't God. See, he says right there, he's less than the Father. So he can't be God. Well, just wait a minute now. We know that Jesus Christ is called the God-man. There's a part of him, and that's not the right way to put it. It's not like a part of him is this and a part of him is that. I don't know how to say it, but a part of him, he's God completely, and yet he's a perfect man without sin completely. And there's the God-man. The Bible says this is God manifest in the flesh, and how many other verses? Emmanuel, God with us, and on and on it goes. Yes, we know that. This is deity. This is God in a man's body right there. So he could go to the cross of Calvary. So that God could be put to death for the sins of all people of all time. Pay the punishment of your sins, my sins of all time. And die and be risen from the, from the dead. God's manifest in the flesh. This word greater is mega, bigger. And over in verse 12, he says, about greater works shall he do. And the disciples of that and the believers will do greater works than him. If we think of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he says that the Father is greater than me, then we must consider and not forget, as in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Father, if it be possible, take this cup from me. I don't want to go through this. It's a horrible thing that's before me. But not as I will, but thy will be done. Ah, there it is. It's servitude. Okay? It's not that he is less in godliness or the Godhead or anything. It's not, it's not true. But in his position at that present time, he was being a servant to the Father and a servant basically to all of mankind, wasn't he? And that's what that means. He was subservient. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9 says, Jesus was made lower than the angels. The angels are a higher kind of being. Jesus was made lower than the angels. Why? For the suffering of death, as we already mentioned. That he could go to that cross pay for our sins with his life because the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. God did, does nothing wrong. He's ultimately holy, absolutely holy rather. And Jesus came to take our sin. You think about that, eh? Just think on that one. Chew on that for a while and we should. How God, perfect and absolutely holy, comes down here and takes on a, a perfect sinless body because it was a uh, 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 um, we went over that, that how, how, the, uh, how the baby was without sin and so on and so forth. How that God would take that upon himself. Uh, Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 to 11 talks about how Jesus made himself of no reputation. He didn't want to be uh, uh, acknowledged or something. He didn't want to be talked about. He didn't, 
I shouldn't say it that way, but you know what I mean. He brought himself, even his birthplace, and we talked about that, we had the thing on the board there, was a, a, that the manger, a feeding trough for animals, is how he brought himself in the lowest position. He took on a subservient role, not a subservient essence, <laughs> but he just wanted to be that servant. That's what it means there. I'm not talking about deity and such. It's talking about his job, as it were, at that time and what he took on for himself. In the grand plan of redemption, the roles of father and son define authority or subservience. The Lord Jesus would be exalted, and you'll note, you read your Bible and study it, that at the resurrection of Christ, he is exalted and lifted up. Okay? But right for the time being right there, he's made himself on the level of mankind. Okay? So if anybody gives you trouble with that, you can take them to those verses and things and help them understand that. Uh, let's go on. So he's telling them uh, about what's going to take place. In verse 29, And now I have told you before it come to pass, when it is come to pass, you might believe it. Okay, we have to find out what is it. Well, we already talked about that. We talked about the context. Okay? Context means a lot. Yes, we study every word, and context is absolutely important as well. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. The it. He's talking about... He's, I don't believe... I just say this because you might have a different uh, point of view or whatever. I don't believe he's talking about uh, being resurrected, coming back. That's not what he's talking about. Because he's talking about the Spirit of God coming, that would be Pentecost. And how many times, you look, how many times the Comforter mentioned through here? That's what this is all about, this section from early on from verse, uh, uh, did I say 16? Let's look here. Yeah, verse 16 on here. That's what he's talking about, basically. And I have told you before it comes to pass that when it comes to pass, you might believe. Okay? Pentecost, the Spirit of God would come and would come upon them and would come upon every believer. Um, the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, it says, After that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. It talks about He is the earnest of our redemption. It's like a down payment. When you trust in Jesus Christ, when you believe and you see yourself as that sinner before God, it is very necessary. You've got to see that. People just don't see the Savior. You've got to see that the reason that He came was because of our sins and see yourself for who you are before God. There's none righteous, no, not one. I'm a sinner. I'm undone. There's nothing I can do. I'm not going to get there. Something has to be done with my sin. And Jesus took it upon himself. That's repentance. We see it. We say, oh Lord, forgive me. And you see Jesus Christ as the Savior. And then the Spirit of God comes and dwells right in there, right at that point, that time. And you're sealed forever. You're, he's not going anywhere. You're not going anywhere without him. He's not going anywhere without you. Some people say, oh, you can lose your salvation. What, by committing a sin? Well, that's absolute blasphemy because Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, God on the cross paying for your sins, He didn't forget one. He didn't leave any of them out. Amen? We should be shouting hallelujah. He left out nothing. And even today, uh, Christians have problems of, and it's natural. We think uh, sometimes we do dumb things, say dumb things, think dumb things, or you fill in the blank, you know what I'm talking about. Oh, how could I even be, what? maybe I'm not saved. It's not about you and me. It's not about your performance or my performance or anybody else's performance. It's about Jesus Christ paid for all the sins of all time. He's the sacrifice once and for all, for all sins. That includes the present and the future. Amen? When we see that and understand that, it doesn't mean that, oh, now I can go and sin. If you have that attitude, I'll bet you you're not saved. Because if you have that attitude that you want to go and continue and do just whatever you want and sin, you're still in your iniquities. You're still in the gall of bitterness and, and the bondage of sin. 
for the Christian, I don't want to sin. We don't want to do those. I don't want to do that. But Romans chapter 7, read it. The things that I want to do, I can't. The things that I, 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 I don't want to do, I do, and so on and so forth. That's the battle within of the old nature versus the spirit. The Bible says that the spirit lusts against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. But praise God for Jesus Christ for his, what he's done. It's not, don't forget, it's not about you. Don't get feeling, oh I'm, oh, I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy or whatever. None of us are worthy, but he paid for it because he loves us and he's going to take us unto himself and the spirit of God lives in there. And he's, when, he, when he leaves, you're going with him. <laughs> or rather, when you leave, he's going with you. Because the Bible says that uh, um, death is when the spirit leaves the body. Okay? Tells us that. And the spirit of God just have us by the hand, or, uh, and away we go. <laughs> Isn't that something? Amen. And rejoice. Anyway, that's the truth of that right there. Um, for I've told you before it come to pass that when it comes to pass, you might believe. And hereafter, that means or no longer, I'm not going to, he says, hereafter I will not talk much with you. He says, I'm not going to talk much with you right now because something's taking place here. Something, uh, the prince of this world is coming. We know that uh, the Bible tells us that the devil uh, indwelt Judas, possessed, possessed him at this point. And uh, 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 Judas is going to betray the Lord. He's going to come back. They're going to arrest him. And you know the rest of the story, don't you? That's why he says the prince of this world comes. That word prince means arc. Arche means over above. The number one ruler of this world. This world. Why is it that we have such a... And, and we let the world and things get into our hearts and such. Hey, that's just as bad as that fear we're talking about in your heart. And the devil rules over this world, doesn't he? Yep. And he has nothing in me. The prince of this world comes and has nothing in me. The devil himself is inside Judas. How did this happen, Judas? How did this happen to him? How did it happen? Wow. A number of things that take place. Uh, there, was a, there was a tremendous greed that the man had. He was a thief. He was a liar. He was a deceiver. He rejected God. That's just some of the ways that the door is opened for the enemy to get into the life or even right into the person. And that's what happened to him. He was a willing participant in that whole thing. He was willing to go and betray the Lord Jesus Christ. An open door to possession and oppression through negative things, sinful things. You know, we read in the Bible about how many devils and demons cast out. I think it's more rampant today because there's more garbage out there for people to watch and look at and see and behave and, and things like that. Just more of it. Let's carry on. But we have here with uh, um, Judas, the devil possessed him at that time and oppressed him. Later he leaves him because Judas all oh, has a change of mind and he's, what have I done kind of thing? And he goes back and tries to make it right and he can't make it right and he has the wrong kind of repentance and all that sort of thing. Um, in Revelation chapter 8, verse 23, it tells us that, it says, talking about the devil himself, by thy sorceries, were all nations deceived. And he deceived Judas, okay? And he deceives people today. And while we're on the subject, the Lord Jesus was saying that uh, there's nothing in common. He's got nothing to do with me, he says. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and I hope you're writing down these references, and you can look them up and study them later. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, it says that the devil himself blinds the minds of those who, that believe not, that don't believe the gospel. He blinds your mind. This is coming from the Word of God. God has said this. God is teaching, showing, this is what's happened. Okay? This is what's happened. That the minds of those that believe not 
are blinded, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them and they should be saved. The devil's doing all he can to keep you from being saved. He's holding you back, wanting to hold you back, but he's not stronger than the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes upon an individual, opens your understanding, oh, I see it. Lord, when you see it, you run to him, eh? Think about that one. And if you're listening today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, the Bible says that the devil is blinding your mind with the things of the world and lusts and all these things, filling you up that you don't want, you can't think about it. You need to cry out. You need to see that you're a sinner undone before God. You need to turn to Jesus Christ and be saved. Okay? Colossians 1.13 says that when a person is saved, they are, we've talked about this many times, he's moved or transported or translated from the devil's power. And that word power we have in the Bible for that verse means authority. He has authority over the unsaved. We're translated from the devil's power, from his authority, from the authority of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. Amen. Hallelujah. A sinner like me, removed from the authority, uh, the power, the blindness of the enemy, and placed into the kingdom of Christ. What a wonderful thing, eh? What an amazing thing. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, it says that the devil has the power of death. And it's interesting to note that that word power in Hebrews 2.14 is a different word from the word power in Colossians that we just talked about, which means authority. In Hebrews 2.14, talking about the devil and the power of death, that word has the idea of a dominion. This is his dominion. This is his realm. This is where he rules. This is his thing. Death. There's a saying I heard a long time ago, and it's so true. The dead love dead things. The dead mean those that are not uh, saved. You're not alive in Christ. You're, you spirit, you're spiritually dead. And the dead love dead things. They love the horror stories and horrible things and the, all that stuff. The dead love dead things. If you find yourself Christian as a person who lo likes that stuff, you better get yourself to God because something's wrong. Something's wrong in your life, in your thought process, in your heart that you're supposed to be protecting. That's not normal. That's the realm of the devil. That's his dominion, the death. God is life, the Bible says. The devil, he's death. Okay? The dead love dead things. In uh, Hebrews 2.14 it says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus, Likewise, took part of the same, of flesh and blood, that through death he might destroy him that had the power or the dominion of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So for the Christian, you look back and say, wow, look at that, under bondage. You were blinded. The Fear of death was upon you. All those things, the devil's authority. But all that's gone. And when you get saved, you trust in Christ, you become a new creature, you become one of his children. Some people say, oh, we're all God's children. No, we're not. If you're not saved and trusted in Jesus Christ, you're one of the devils. He doesn't care about you. You're just fodder for the fires of hell. I'm sorry, but that is the truth. That's what the Bible says, and the truth shall set you free. You need to trust in Christ. You need to run to Jesus. You need to do that. Okay? And that, create, that power is the word kratos. What are we going to do a study on that? We won't do that today then. Um, let's go on. Where are we? Uh, verse 31. Now, oh yeah, okay. Let me do it this way. Uh, 31, I'm going to break it up into two parts. Uh, the last part, arise, let us go hence. I'm going to leave that for next week because there's some explanations with that that we don't have time for right now. Um, verse 31, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. What does he do? What's he going to do? He's going to go to the cross. He's going to go to the cross. 
He's going to die on the cross. He's going to be risen from the dead. And there's going to be, in a, a, a few days, he's going to ascend to the Father. He's going to do what's placed upon him, what the Father wants him to do. Okay? Because he loves the Father. The Father gave him a commandment. This is what you're going to do in the garden. Could you imagine? Could you imagine? And we can't imagine. Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he could understand and feel and know what it was like to have that whip that was coming on his back. And how they were going to beat him. And how they were going to pull out his beard. How they were going to put that crown of thorns on him. How they were going to beat him to a pulp so you wouldn't even recognize him. He says, oh boy, this looks this is serious stuff. I don't really want to do that. But I have to. He's going to do it. Not my will, but by and be done. I think one of the first things we should say in the morning when we get up is, Father, what will thou have me to do today? He says, one of the things I want you to do is guard your heart. Especially in this day and age, this filthy, horrible age. As bad as or probably worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay? On comparison with. And it says that uh, Lot, his righteous soul was vexed by the, the filthiness of the wicked. Something like that. Seeing and hearing of the wicked. Keep your heart. It's your heart. No, it's not. I made a mistake. When we get saved, we don't belong to us anymore. God has purchased you with the blood of Christ. Amen? It's his heart, really. You're just like it's a, like a rental or a lease or something. I don't know how you'd say it. It's something to think about, eh? So we're going to stop here. When we get to verse 15, he's going to start on another topic. But in the meanwhile, there's a thing in between there. As I said, we'll do that next week. As the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Another big teaching for us. Whatever God says, whatever God wants us to do, and on a daily basis, Lord, what will thou have me to do? Who said that? That was the Apostle Paul on the Damascus Road. He met with Jesus Christ, that light shining down. He heard the voice. And he says, Lord, what will thou have me to do? He saw in a moment's time, in a moment's time that he was a sinner. And he's on the wrong path. He cries out, Lord. Anyway, we have to stop. The book of John is fascinating. All the Bible is fascinating. Study it. Um, know what the Lord expects of you. See what he's like. Just an amazing thing. Run to Jesus Christ if you're not saved. Just run. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your grace. We thank you for this time to look into the Bible, Lord, these few things today. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that dwells within the believer. And Lord, we ask you to just take this message and touch hearts for your glory. And we just thank you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, folks, for uh, joining us. I hope there's somebody out there listening anyways. That would be good. We'll pray about that, that people would hear and listen, and they would get stirred up, that uh, unbelievers would get saved, and that the saints would be strengthened. Praise the Lord, eh? Hallelujah. There we go. Thank you. See you again. Bye now.